All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining, and welcome to another webinar with Ularity. Uh, my name is Tanu Joshi. I'm the founder and CEO, and I have our esteemed guest today, uh, Paresh Rajwat, who leads all of Facebook's uh, video and music products. So if you don't know what Ularity is, we are the technology system of record for many recognizable multi-location brands, which use our platform to digitize their marketing infrastructure. Uh, this webinar is going to be approximately our usual 30 to 40 minutes. Question and answers are through the chat box on the Zoom window, and we have time reserved in the end, approximately five minutes. So please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, so, and the topic that we are discussing today is uh, Paresh's expertise. He leads product uh, for music and video at Facebook to build or not to build. So, you know, many of our listeners here are executives at multi-location franchise brands and, and they own their companies. So whenever they come across priorities of deciding you know, to, to try out a concept, to try out a new thing, how, how do they choose whether to go ahead with it or not? So uh, before we go into that topic, Paresh, like I would hand over the mic to you and for a brief intro. It's been, it's been a long time, man, for, since we've had this coming. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks for having me, Tanoj. Um, Hope everything's good with uh, with everyone on the on the call with you know your, yourself uh, the families with you know especially with COVID going on and also all the stuff happening with racial injustice. Um, I just hope everyone's doing good. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so you know we uh, we are seeing these unprecedented times. We were by, uh, we were. Uh, uh, kind of held captive by a pandemic and then we you know we stand for the racial inequality in this country and uh, hope uh, we can all get uh, to the better side of this so Paresh, I, I i think i met you uh, approximately like more than 7 years ago now 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 in france in a, in a and in a company called Critio where we both used to be together and they were the inventors of remarketing and you have been uh, uh, you know, across Microsoft, across Facebook, we have a very illustrious resume from uh, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook. So tell me something that you, you know, which kind of binds all these three major companies together, right? And how some of our viewers here who are owners of small businesses, how, how can they take, learn something from these giants? Uh, and how, what, what, what do you guys do right now? <laughs> uh, that's that's the million dollar question. It's um, uh, I would say each of the companies that I worked at are are unique and different, uh, and I think that's uh, that's really important to know. Uh, and each of them is grounded in grounded in their own principles, which sets them apart, right? And we'll take uh, I'll just take random examples in my experiences. Um, take Apple for example. Uh, I mean the way Apple builds products is very different from what most of the companies, how most of the companies build products. Um, and I, I still remember going through the initial uh, trainings when you join Apple. Um, and, uh, you know, I was at Microsoft before joining Apple. So you can just imagine how, how big of a difference that is. Uh, you know, Microsoft, which is all PC, then you go to Apple, which is all iOS and, and Mac and, and, and stuff like that. So, it was very interesting where uh, you basically, th uh, there was a training where people asked like, hey, how do you build products, right? And most of the time, the common answer or the, the most uh, answer is like build for what people want, right? So understanding customers first uh, becomes a priority and then everything else like, you know, product second, blah, 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 all that stuff comes in. Um, at Apple, the way Apple thinks is, is, is not exactly like that. Um, for them, product first, customer second. And when I heard that, it really baffled me for a second. It's like, wait, what? Uh, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, but it does in the case of Apple. Uh, and it does in the case of Apple because Apple says the, the, the kind of products Apple builds are the things that it's hard for people to imagine. Okay? So it's very similar to if you ask someone saying like, hey, what do you want? They will give you a very literal answer. And you know, there's a very common saying where like, you know, when the first car came out, when if you were to ask people, what do you want? They would have said like faster horses, right? But like no one would have said, I need something like a car, 
So it's it's very similar concept that Apple always applies, whether it's like you know coming off the iPhone or any new products, where they understand customer needs, but it's not like ask customer what they want and literally build for that, right? So I think it's it's just a different way of uh, of saying. So when they say product first, it's basically extracting what the customer wants into a product that cannot be imagined by people. But when you launch that product, it makes the complete difference in terms of like what really the people wanted. So it was very interesting. So they have that philosophy. The second thing is like, it's so much about quality. And when Apple launches the first product, it's like, it's hundred percent done, right? The simple things like opening the, the packet, the end-to-end -end consumer experience is what they really, really care about. And the, that is because the top value for Apple is surprise and delight, right? So they really believe in like, really surprising the market and delighting the market with what they give. And the delight goes for end-to-end -end product. So Apple works in a very different way. Uh, and let's take another example, say your Facebook. Um, Facebook has a completely different way of operation, right? And although there are lots of similarities, there are, there are similarities between uh, all the companies, like you know, people first and, um, uh, and really the mission and, and uh, solving for the mission for both these companies. But the way of operation is, a very incremental and fast moving for Facebook, which is very different from like, let's wait until the end to end full product is done for Apple. Uh, and it could be because of the hardware software ways of doing things, but uh, culturally it's very, very different. Um, I would say at Facebook, it's more about, let's take big bold bets. Uh, let's incrementally work towards those bets and be flexible and nimble to change ourselves as we learn more. Right, and uh, a big thing I have learned, especially my five, six years now at Facebook is you should never get too with the idea you have. And many they had, and in the perfect sense of that idea that they are not flexible. And when they, uh, when they do something, build a product and they launch it in the market and it doesn't fully work, uh, they don't give up. Uh, or they don't, they, do, they don't try to evolve themselves. They kind of are continue to stick on that same path for too long uh, to the point where they finally give up, right? Compared to the way I would say Facebook operates is like, you have to have very strong opinions. So it's not about being loosey-goosey throughout, uh, but have very strong opinions, have bold thinking, have very articulated, like best, best thinking at that point. But as you get more data, be nimble because you don't know really how the world will adopt your products and what trends will emerge. So quickly learn from data and be open to like making changes to your product is really like the big, one of the big uh, uh, cultures I would say within Facebook. So, I mean, this is just a quick way of saying like companies are very different um, and it really, you know, uh, uh, every company is unique. So when it comes to your company, you have to, you have to make sure your vision is clear uh, is ambitious, um, you set a culture and you decide what kind of culture you want uh, and then stick to that culture, right? And I think that's the key over here. Tanuja, you on mute, I can't hear you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, sorry about that. So we always say in our, in our product meetings, right? Or with our, or with our engineer, don't get attached, right? That, that's, 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 that's the core because, you know, there are many, folks here who uh, get attached to stuff and then when they, and they don't want to give give up something that they worked hard on and that's something which facebook has pioneered so and those are just not things which are i i think important for the the, the multi-billion or trillion dollar companies uh now it's more even if you know you tomorrow start a business of your own those are the things that you can take which are never get too attached as you were saying from an apple you can basically take that your customers know their problems the best they all they, they always don't know the solutions the best right they, they they will point you towards what problems they are having but it's your job to interpret those problems and not go into a literal solution there there are yeah. so many so there's so many ways to interpret the problem yeah and and then so on you know and, th and those are some of the important things that you learn and i guess you, you know you, you would agree that you would apply them at whatever scale you can small or large exactly. right exactly and i would yeah. say even when you think about apple you know and let's take an example as like hey 
you don't attach yourself too much to the idea. How does that work at Apple? Because you're launching the product and like, that is it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think what people don't know is like the, the making of the product process of Apple and how many iterations they go through until yeah. they get it right, right? And like the micro, which is nothing, but in some way they have launched the V1 long time ago and iterated, iterated, iterated on it and launched like the whatever that internal V10 and that's yeah. like really like amazing and what people, uh, yeah. you know, what we find launching. Right? So in some yeah. way, all the, the same process happens everywhere. Um, uh, it's just like, you know, uh, what how do you see? It is. Correct. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I think you, uh, I think I read somewhere and then the basketball saying that you, you, you never see the shots that they miss, right? You always, you always see about the shots that they, that they succeed yeah. in. Yeah, right. Cool. And so, so, you know, kind of changing gears for a second, you've been doing remote work. Facebook's, uh, you know, a very distributed company and you have teams all over, I'm assuming all over the world. You or yourself are in Seattle and your team would be in San Francisco. And well, so talk to me a little bit about how you guys are managing this, this, this remote work. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, some part of the remote work was always there because teams were geographically, distrib- geographically distributed, but now everyone is on the same level field, I would say, uh, yep. because everyone is uh, is remote in some way. And it really doesn't matter where you are if you can make the time zone when everyone yeah. can come together. Yep. Um, I, I would say we are still learning through it, uh, although, you know, um, every team operates, again, very differently. Um, in my case, the initial first few weeks were very hard when everyone was remote. Uh, yep. And it was very hard because A, we are not used to, uh, used to this way of working. Um, mm-hmm. And at Facebook, we have uh, each meet, meeting is usually 30 minutes. Okay, we have 30 minute meetings. We don't have longer meetings than that. Mm-hmm. And even if my calendar was full uh, packed for, from like you know nine in the morning to like 6 p.m., um, the same calendar when you're remotely working felt a lot more intense. And it felt a lot more intense because what happens is you hang up from your meeting at 11.30 and you dial back at 11.30 point something or 11.30 yeah, yeah. Um, And that just felt like um, endless end to uh, like continuous constant switching of context with no break and you yeah. sitting in your own, uh, the same chair. Um, yeah. The same thing happens, but what happens is many times you change your conference rooms, you walk, you get some water, yeah. you know, you're at work, and that small micro break of 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes makes a big difference. So yeah. one of the things that we uh, all try to do is like make the meetings shorter uh, and shorter by uh, make it 25 minutes instead of 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I think that has been such a big, at least for me, it's like, it's amazing to see how that small break has actually led people to a finish the same discussion we used to have in 30 minutes, now in 25. So really yep. nothing is lost that way, but yep. that five minute break has actually given people a, uh, enough time to context switch. So, you know, things like that has, has really helped me. Uh, a second, second thing I've seen is like, just make sure people invest you, you know, if you're all working remotely, invest in a good, good chair, good table, uh, uh, you yeah. know, if you like to st- stand and work, like get a thing that like can go up and down, like you can stand as well. It's, it's a one-time investment but uh, get a really good chair because that will make a big difference. You're going to be on that thing for like eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So I think getting that right is really, really important. Um, and like everyone- How are you of- keeping your team? Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm saying, how are you guys keeping your team members motivated uh, yeah. right during, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know, a few things we have done is, um, uh, we, you know, we meet more often, but very casually for 15 minute check-in, I'll have with my entire, uh, entire product team or my leads, uh, and more, more frequent in a week. So we initially, we started with daily, but that felt yeah. too much because, you know, people yeah. were the, the conflicts of meetings and all that stuff. So now we meet yeah. two to three times a week. Um, yep. and it's no agenda. Uh, it's yeah. literally people saying like how things are going, what's going on. And. Uh, most of the time people, you know, it's only non-work talk, but it's good yeah. because we hear different things and, uh, and just check in on people. So I think that has been really, really good. Um, yeah. we, uh, you know, and getting used to doing all hands together online, uh, more events online. I, I feel like that has, that has started to help. We haven't clearly, yeah. you know, like uh, most of the companies, we fully haven't nailed the exact model of what remote yeah. working would be, but uh, we're evolving very fast. 
Yeah, no, that's that, that's really important, right? Because to kind of, it's very easy to get lost in just work chat and never kind of, uh, you know, go into understanding how everybody's feeling on the team. Because so we have this daily stand up at 11 where we try to talk about work, but also try to plug in something which is not work related. For example, these days our lead iOS engineer suggested we all talk about the, the coffee mug that we are drinking coffee out of. Why is that special? So we choose a random topic for the week and then we stick to it. Somebody, you know, last week was a hat week. We were trying, we were all wearing a different baseball hat and we had to tell a 10 second story about it. So it's just important to kind of, you know, keep the, uh, keep the conversations as best as we can, like we, ha we used to have them in the office. And yeah. Um, um, yeah, and keep, you know, work always then uh, work comes first, but then all these things. Yeah. I, right. I, so I like um, the idea of picking a topic and, and yeah, and maybe you can use it at Facebook, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can just, uh, yeah, for 10 seconds, you have to talk about that. Yeah. yeah so, then the, so our next one is what the, what's the first thing that you got, that you want to do or what you've been dreaming of doing right after the pandemic again. So we were going to all talk about that for like 10, 10 seconds in our next standup starting next week. Uh, uh, that will be amazing. I think just knowing what, what that is, it's going to be interesting of like what you want to do and what you can do. Yeah, yeah. No, the first thing after pandemic again. So that's, that's oh, like pandemic. The, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah right. well, yeah. Yeah, so what are, what are people dreaming? Yeah. All right, so moving uh, swiftly on to the next point. You know, you guys now are, of course, seen you know, you guys are at the center of two billion plus users on the on the, on the planet. So, uh, and you are seeing trends probably which nobody could have predicted like four months ago, right? So, and now you've launched shops, you've launched rooms. There, I'm sure there are a bunch of other products in the pipeline. So, from your perspective, what are some of the larger micro macro economic trends that you are seeing? knowing the fact that your consumer base and your business revenue base is made a bunch out of like the small businesses, right? Like, I mean, I've heard Cheryl, I, I, I once somewhere read Cheryl that you guys represent like one in two or one in three, some, some absurdly high number of small businesses on the platform or local multi-location businesses. Everybody uses Facebook advertising. So what are some of the trends in the, the micro macro sector that you are seeing? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, that's something that we, um, uh, we try to study as much as we can, just given you know, the world is changing so fast around us. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say that the core to what you talked about, uh, SMBs, you know, SMBs have been uh, hit uh, really hard. Um, and SMBs that actually had some kind of remote presence have been still able to navigate to a certain extent. Um, so I would say coming out of the pandemic, one of the things that we, we believe is likely going to happen is uh, most of the SMBs, if not all, are going to look at like, hey, backup options of like making sure you have a online presence um, and uh, you know you can do transactions and, and kind of business online because your stores are going to be closed. And if a lot of people were just coming into the stores and buying things, now they can't. Um, and because you don't have a website, even if they wanted something, you can't even send it to them and, and stuff like that. So. Uh, so I, I think a, a big uh, trend is going to happen in that direction. Uh, that's the exact reason why, you know, we believed shops was a really good way for us to make sure SMBs can come online, can, you know, still keep themselves afloat and actually grow. Because over time, I would say like when the pandemic is over, this is going to be a mix of your store plus uh, online store, right? Your physical and online store. So hopefully it should be incremental. And a lot of SMBs will start seeing more money coming actually from online than what they make in physical in general. Uh, so I see like we, we see that as one of the big trends. Um, I would say, uh, you know, again, depends on which group. If you ask at Facebook, they see trends within their, uh, mm -hmm. you know, their areas much clearer. Uh, at the very macro level, of course, we see education as one of the big trends uh, of like things moving online, and it it comes from all many of you, many of us who have families and stuff and kids all doing online schools and very quickly adopting to all the tools online. So I would say over the next once uh, this thing is over, schools might not fully open up for a while, right? I and mean, uh, even yep. next 
school year, we don't know how things are still going to be. Um, so people are evolving really fast. Schools are looking at lots of solutions uh, and hacking things together to make it work. But over time, you know, there will be solutions that just solve this case and this, this issue for schools. Yep. To so I feel like online education is going to be a big one. Uh, telemedicine, we, we are seeing a lot more interesting, like, you know, we see a lot of groups uh, uh, come up in telemedicine as well, where people are just curious to get answers before you could just go to your doctor and get it. Now doctors are so busy, they can't take any patients beyond critical conditions. But if you need any of the advice, then, you know, telemedicine could become a, a, a really good uh, uh, trend over there as well. Yeah. Uh, contact like, uh, contactless commerce. Um, you know, how do you do payments? And just like, even if you're in stores, like just pay through your phone and you don't have to use the credit card machines and like, you know, touch all this stuff here and there. Uh, I, I think that is going to be another really big trend. Um, yeah. And when it comes to space, Facebook specific, we have just seen just the, this increase in, uh, in like, you know, solidarity uh, uh, work streams and how do you, how do people come together and uh, the, the, um, uh, the the role local communities play um, yeah. when you are in things like a pandemic has just been mind blowing, um, yeah. and I would say there's a lot more that is going to happen. An avenue for people to stay in touch at local level, avenue for people to stay in touch with the communities that matter to them in the world in general. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of trends in all these directions as well. Yeah, no, absolutely, you're right. So I mean, it's it's kind of surprising to me that when um, you know, um, the, the pandemic hit, most of our uh, advertisers or local guys, they did not really shut down advertising, but they were reaching more out to their communities with whatever budget they can through advertising. So we saw like a lot of AdWords, you know, kind of going up funnel in terms of like their brand awareness saying, we are here with you. And now with the, um, the Black Lives Matter mo uh, moment. So we are so there. So it's 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 not the the value of community and talking to them has never been higher, right? Because you want you know your customers are around you and the people want to tell them that the, the businesses have the same values as the customers do. So it's it's a, it's a very important point. And then that's you know that's one of the things that but but has kept Ularity kind of thriving in this time is the fact that we can. Uh, provide those kind of tools to our users to get the, the message out locally. Yep. Well, that's great. Um, so, you know, I, I think now I'm coming to the crux of this webinar, which is um, um, the competing priorities, right? Like you guys at Facebook have so many product ideas and just like how executives on this call, I'm sure, you know, when pe people knock on their door and say, wait, I want to execute this new idea. I want to execute, I want to change the way this looks or, you know, there's so many product ideas. Um, so the question that I have for you is how do you, how do you, there, there would be a Paresh style of solving them. There would, there would be a Facebook style of solving them. There would be all these awesome styles of solving them. So how do you decide that, you know, this is worth giving a shot, you know, and then this is worth pulling the plug on or this is just worth, out right now, right? So, so talk, to, talk to me a little bit about how do you decide what, where, to, where are you going to invest? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question and something, um, uh, something that we all continuously improve on because you never necessarily get it right. And there is no, uh, yeah. uh, uh, there is no you know, one answer or one framework that actually will solve this, uh, uh, solve this big uh, riddle. But I yeah. would say how the way I operate is usually a portfolio approach. Uh, and in my portfolio, I always have bets that are, uh, you know, very new bets and you will have certain allocation done for very new, scrappy, zero to one. It might work, it might fail, like big chance of fail could happen. But hey, if it works, it, it could be a pretty interesting one. Uh, and then, you know, those some are your, those are your penny stocks, then, right? Correct. Exactly. It could yeah. be, right? Yeah. And then yeah. you have your things that are like, hey, they have kind of initially showed what you call as product market fit, very initial um, and we are just kind of putting them in the next phase um, to see if this will, you know, the, the, uh, it will still stick. And you're kind of bringing it to like the V3, V4, like just the feature set to see if it's growing. And then you have things that are like really mature, but you want to continue to grow, right? So, uh, so I, I really look at the teams always from a portfolio. You can be only doing the cash cow, which is only like the things that are being 
uh, you know, mature and working because you know everything has a cycle and that those things will die at some point. Um, or anything that is just zero to one because that's too randomizing and uh, you you know you never get something which brings you the stability that will kind of continue to bring the income. So it's always about how much portfolio uh, you want, uh, and that's the key thing. Now within so something that is mature we already know right like that's mature and we basically take goals that are more growth goals for things that are mature. Um, the things that are very, very early, you can't take growth goal because you haven't even proved the product market fit. So what you really need over there is a proof product market fit. Second, you know, take more retention kind of metrics as goals, because those are the things that will lead you to building really good products. Um, ship goals like, hey, I shipped X product or X thing are terrible goals for those things because it means nothing. Um, so, uh, so make sure like the teams are taking goals that are more tangible and that are more aligned to you validating the hypotheses you had and making sure like people or whoever customer base is using it, it they are retaining, uh, which means they will ask and they will come back for this product. So those are like the key things in terms of metrics, how I select which ideas. Uh, that's a really interesting one as well. Um, I, I would say, you know, there are a few ways to look into it. Like, a is, of course, you look at potential, right? But B is you look at like, how quickly can I validate certain hypotheses as well? So uh, you could think about a portfolio within that portfolio where something could be like a really long-term bet. I want to completely disrupt an industry. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's a zero to one interesting idea, but it's just going to take a very long time to prove anything. But there could be some very small things you could do and quickly validate uh, uh, and get signal. And I usually like to get signal quickly and move forward um, compared to you know working on a project for like three years and still not sure where it's going. Um, yeah, so I think that's in general uh, the framework I use or uh, the, the strategies I use. Tanuji, I think you're on mute again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep muting myself just to make sure that there are no background noises. But three years in in, in today's world, if you're waiting for a pro building a product for three years and waiting for launch, then then you know th those are like thirty years back back in the day. So yeah, no, yeah. you know what what I what I have found useful is that whatever is the value system of the company, which for Facebook might be like you know we we want to you want a better connected world. You plot that that is this product bringing value and what's the complexity. And if you plot your products on that, those two scales, high value, low complexity, those are low hanging fruits, right? Go for them, right? But if they're up in the, in the right hand corner, those are, you can get like a moonshot out of that, which we, our previous webinar was about moonshots, high value to your customers, high complexity, you should always have one of those. So yeah. that's, that's how we basically design our portfolios in those four quadrants of high value, low value, high complexity, low complexity. We make sure that there's, there's some representation of each of those quadrants in it. And then importantly, right, like at some point there's learn to say yes, uh, you know, learn to gamble and learn to say no are, are, are your two best friends. So you should, you should have a little bit of a gambling mind. I think all product leaders have that. If you don't, then you're bound to fail. But if you also don't know when to say no, then you then you fail. So so learn to gamble, learn to say no, is is and the, the act of balancing that is probably the 101 product management. If you ever write, you know, if I ever write a book on that, that would be, that would be the title. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, yeah. Quick, quickly uh, wrapping it up. I uh, got four more minutes. What are you, um, you know, just, just want to learn a little more about what are you keeping, uh, what are you doing to keep yourself motivated during these times, right? Is there, is there anything apart from invest? I'm sure you've gotten a really awesome chair by now. And um, <laughs> the whole setup, setup is awesome. Is there, is there anything that has helped you get over these darker times or anything you're reading, you're running, you're, you're spending more time with family, of course. So, yeah. Yeah, what's, what's, so, um, absolutely. The family is keeping me very busy with kids being home and, you know, homeschooling and, and, uh, um, and just keeping them around and keeping them involved um, is a project by itself. Uh, one thing I have picked up, although is, um, uh, is I'm doing a bunch of stuff on, on the yard. So it's a project where like, yeah, I'm just re redoing the yard of the house. You know, we moved recently, yeah. as you know, to Seattle. Um, yeah. And there are some parts that, you know, uh, we don't exactly like how it is. 
so we are kind of changing all that stuff and because you can't get anyone to do so you're now you know doing it yourself and it's been an amazing fun project i would say um, yep. i'm taking my time to do it but uh, but i feel like picking something like that which over the weekends you can spend 6 7 8 hours uh, you know just working on stuff has been uh, has been very very refreshing because you take your mind away from you know just regular you're outside um, and you're busy and you're kind of like you know uh, getting incremental progress throughout so I would say that's been uh, that's been fascinating so far. Yeah, no, that's that's important. I've I've I'd read somewhere and I've personally implemented it. It's like it would be it's important to pick up something in this in this time which involves physical activity more than other times right like so if i thought i would read more it's it's important but it's also kind of you're you're already stuck in front of a computer or a screen or i would learn like video editing or things like that those things are awesome but if you can pick up like something of a physical activity or something to do with your hands that gives you another sense of uh kind of calmness i guess during this yeah. time than others like for example like i i've picked i'm making an old wooden model ship uh one of those ones you see in a glass case but it nice. gives you immense gratification wow. right because you're 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 using your hands to do something and after seven hours in front of the screen you you, you get to the point that you want no screens or you know yeah. no more no more ingesting more knowledge you know and just doing something with your hand good old i hands. fully agree i i think doing yeah. something that is a physical activity uh, picking something new, I think it's it's definitely it's definitely working out and and keeps you going. Yeah. All right. Cool. We, so we are at time. I would open it up for four or five minutes to questions. If there are any, please use the chat box, uh, folks, to en enter any questions uh, for Paresh, and we will we'll take it from uh, and we'll be glad to answer them. There are none. That's also that's also great. Please, but please keep the questions coming. Right. Give give people three or four minutes. So so while we while we get the questions or set some people are trying questions for all our viewers, our next webinar is with Marla. Our founder and chief operating officer, Adam Chandler, would be conducting an interview with Marla Skiko. She's the global head of media at Ford. As you know, Ford has been an integral part of the, this country's progress in, uh, over the course of years. And now how, how they're responding to the pandemic instead of uh, with the car sales and with car manufacturing and the Defense Act. So this would be a great one. So folks, please uh, feel free to uh, join this one. All right. Cool. I, I see some questions coming questions. in. Questions, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there, there, yeah. So let's let's go from let's go from the top. How do you what? How do you develop music products at Facebook? What does music mean at Facebook? Yeah, a great question. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very very good question, and this is interesting because you know, music. What people don't realize is music is very integrated within Facebook already. Um, and I'll give you examples. It's like when you post a, 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 a birthday video of your kids or like some birthday party, usually many times there is music in the background. You know, you have like wedding videos, there's music in the background. And the number one thing is if you don't have rights to that music to show, you know, to kind of uh, play the music on Facebook, what we have to do is we have to mute the music because the labels don't want it to be played. So one of the big things we need to do is make sure people get the end to end experience when they are posting something, it stays. So our first really thing was like, how can we make sure we, uh, uh, we allow people to use music within the way they express. So whether it's posts, whether it's stories, a lot of people, you know, they create a story, they will add a background music track. That's like the first ways of like how we saw people using music. 
Um, and over time, what we saw is also when people listen to music, many times they will share what music they're listening to. Uh, they will be curious about like, hey, what are some of the tracks that you're listening? There will be so much conversations around happening around new music that's coming out. Um, and if you really look at how Facebook operates, social is at the core. So when we look at music, the way we look at it is not purely as a consumption experience. It's not a streaming service, but more about the community that is around music. Um, and how can you actually express yourself through music? So those are the ways that we will look at in terms of while we build music products on Facebook. Okay. Got it. And I mean, of course you have like stories and, uh, uh, and posts and you'll have more of like premium music videos coming uh, into, into Facebook watch and just Facebook as well. But the objective around that is again, commu uh, connecting people through music. Like that's the number one objective that we have over here. Yep. And does that answer now, Paresh, extends probably to video as well? I mean, video, you guys uh, see a lot of like original content video being posted, but there the next question that comes here is how do you develop uh, video products at Facebook? I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, very similar. I would say if you think about video conferencing, again, you know, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, they were already the top services when it comes to video calling, but was mostly one-to-one -one or very small group calling. And now what we have, what we have done is basically created rooms. Um, and the idea with rooms is again, same as video conferencing spaces where you can just create a space. Uh, and you know, just, just a meeting, something like this, where you can just create a space and people can come in, uh, but it's a lot more collaborative, right? So that's a room and it can be dynamic. And of course, all of that stuff has to be free, right? The, the way Facebook operates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I would, I, would, I would encourage like everybody on the call to at least give it rooms a try and uh, see how it compares to your, your, your current solutions. And, and of course, you know, Facebook is very, very uh, interested in getting feedback and, uh, and, 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 and improving on the product. So give room to try people and you can take it. So, and, and lastly, I'm sure you, this is not the first time you're getting this question, but how does, you know, how does Facebook plan to support uh, SMBs today with any stimulus help? Because I know you guys have already come out with add credit programs and stuff like that. So a lot of our customer base or, or I mean, even business leaders are looking at like, what, what are some of, the, some of the efforts that you guys are taking there? Yeah, um, uh, you know, as you know, we, we announced a um, hundred million dollar um, uh, you know, stimulus for SMBs, uh, uh, which has been activated, uh, you know, whether through its ad credits or other programs, but that's like a big investment that we are making to help the SMB community. If you look at SMBs, there are many different kinds of SMBs, right? So you could also say there are creators, there are musicians, there are yoga teachers, you know, who used to uh, have the small studios and used to do these things. Now they're coming online. So we have kind of different products also that we are enabling for them. Uh, you know, we have a new product that we recently launched, which is called Virtual Events, uh, where a yoga, yoga trainer or any, you know, gym trainer can start a virtual event. They can charge for the virtual event on Facebook. And, you know, you'll have like 10, 30, 40, 50 people, your regular class actually attend that. And it's going to be virtual, but you pay whatever the fees are uh, and you actually have your virtual class, right? So making it seamless and easy for people to do that in one place where you, you know, create the event, payment is done, you go live right in that particular space is something that we are really giving people as well. And yep. then we have like for musicians, we launch products like stars so you know if a musician is performing and you feel like the, the you know the, the musician is doing a really good job um or any creator in general you can give stars to them which is nothing but like you know yeah. uh, it's, it's form of a virtual currency but they get real money out of it yep so that's a good question right i, uh, I think this is do you need a robust local website if you have a facebook business page what is the role of my business page versus my local website and I think, you know, I'll, I'll take a crack at it and I'll then hand it over to you. So I think the whole idea of like robust business pages is the fact that people don't need the expertise to build websites and they can have like an easy presence of uh, through Facebook on, on, on the World Wide Web. So, and it's, it's, it's all templatized and, and pretty sta standard. So what's, what's your take on, you know, should I have a robust page? Should I have a robust website? Both is good, but if you had to pick one. Yeah, probably both is good. Just you have to understand how much effort it is going to go if you were mm -hmm. to build your own website because now you have SEO. Now you have to you know think about like keeping up the website and you know yeah. keeping the changes and 
communication mo modes you know who is going to go there are they going to use are they going to transact uh, so even when it comes to trust a lot of people would be like i don't know what is this looks like a random website you know if it's a new one compared to how do you make sure you bring enough trust into the ecosystem uh, and then you have all these products whether it's communications payments which are just standardized right so yeah. there's a pros and cons of doing both where you get like a standardized solutions out there that just fits yeah. into the flow and uh, again an exposure to like 2 2 to 2.5 billion people you know you mm -hmm. do something here and you now suddenly are, uh, have a potential to reach a ton more people all around the world right yeah. so i think that's how i would say uh, everyone has to assess i i do feel like uh, having a presence on facebook is great uh, and uh, uh, i would definitely uh, uh, you know advise or or uh, uh, motivate uh, a small business to make sure they are maintaining that particular page and uh, uh, and the shops initiative is actually very early um, and might be good for you guys to all look, look into yeah absolutely right we always encourage whenever we partner with a small business to do any any kind of marketing them we definitely make sure that they uh have a, a a robust facebook page and we you know and 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 then those get those that's a very good asset for you to have in advertising not just in the facebook world for 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 the world outside facebook as well which is which is not that big anyway <laughs> um so the last question and then we'll round it up a couple of minutes how do you work in the e i mean that might be for somebody for shops right but again how do you work in the e-commerce space uh, because and do you partner with uh, partner with shopify to help support e-commerce business transactions and this might be too early might be out of scope for you but if you want to give it a try go ahead um it's slightly uh, not fully in my scope because i am not like uh, you know very closely working with the uh, e-commerce team right now we do work yeah. very closely with shopify is what i know uh, okay. Because Shopify does bring a lot of tools that are easy for small businesses to manage their assets and manage their businesses. So I do yeah. know that there's, uh, there's a pretty big integration with Shopify, um, uh, and then there is just like native integration with like e-commerce providers and payment providers uh, yeah. that that we have done already in uh, you know in the backend. Yeah, yeah, we can. I think we can get uh, and. Uh, Anyone who's asking that question, please reach out to us at Sales Atelierity. We will help you get the answers to those questions because Shops is still a new and uh, upcoming platform. So I'm sure these guys are working on all the integrations, but some, some, something as big as Shopify must already be there. All right. Well, those were the questions. Thank you so much, Paresh. It was lovely talking to you. And for folks on the other side of the webinar who are, atten who are attending, please look out for our next webinar with uh, Ford. And thank you again. Signing off. Right. Thank you for thank you for having me, Tanaj. Bye then. Take care, everybody.